So section three in the manufacturing and design class starts us off with um, a look at forming technologies or forming processes. Um, the most common of these or the most known one of these is forging. So uh, we're going to first get into this with chapter nine. There's several chapters in this section. Um, so uh, chapter nine starts us off with an overview of uh, an introduction to forming operations. Okay, so first of all, we want to go back to remember uh, our stress strain diagram, okay? Um, and where we're going to be operating at with the forming processes is in what's called the plastic deformation zone, okay? Or uh, as you can see in the, in the right-hand corner over here, this is also known as the forming range, okay? So basically what's happening in this area uh, for metals is that we're having deformation without the elastic uh, response back, okay? So um, to use the analogy of like a paper clip, if you take a paper clip, if you unbend the paper clip, so it's kind of like a, a, a long wire, and you bend it slightly and then release it, it's going to spring back to its original shape. This is what we, this is what happens in this uh, area right here of the stress strain diagram um, on the left hand side. This is called the elastic range. And basically, when you bend something, it goes back to its original shape. Okay. Um, once you get past this point right here, this uh, marks the, the ending of the elastic range and the beginning of the plastic range or the plastic deformation range. And basically, if you take your paper clip now and you bend it so far that it doesn't spring back to its original shape, then you've gone into this area over here in the uh, plastic deformation, okay? Now, there is a little bit of spring back uh, at some point in here, it's gonna stop, but there is a little bit of spring back, so you can see it in the paper clip when you bend it and uh, so far, and release it. You get a little spring back sometimes, um, but not all the time. But the forming that we're talking about, forging and all the other uh, uh, processes that we're talking about occur in this plastic uh, deformation zone, okay? Um, so this includes stretching, compressing, and bending, okay? Um, and the shaping occurs without material removal, right? So we're not removing material, we're just reshaping it, all right? Uh, so um, the, the forging industry, uh, these numbers are from 2019, is, is a very large industry. It's not as large as casting, okay? Um, casting or, and molding, right? Both plastic and metal casting and molding is larger than the forging industry, but uh, it's still a very substantial uh, industry. Um, and it has, a distinct difference than, uh, or forged parts have a distinct difference than a cast part. So the two are not interchangeable. Um, to create something uh, as a forging uh, requires a necessity that you wouldn't be able to achieve uh, with a, a casting operation, okay? So uh, forged metals, um, almost a third of the forged metals fall into the carbon steel category. So that's the largest, um, uh, type of metal that's used in a forging operation. Uh, coming in second is stainless steel, and then we have aluminum um, and high temperature alloys, nickel and ink and ale, things like that. Um, and then the type of forging, nearly 40% is impression dye forging. And we'll talk about these, these different types of forgings, but uh, nearly 40% is impression dye forging. A little bit over uh, a third is open die forging, okay? And then um, finishing up, we have ring rolling is 10%. Um, the, and the, the kind of the kitchen sink uh, category there is other is another 10%. And then we have impact extrusion and powder forging, okay? Or powder metallurgy. All right, so um, where are uh, forgings used or created? Well, many, many of the large, notice that all of these uh, examples are, with the exception of medical, with the exception of medical, are um, where we have large machines, 
Okay. And that's one of the defining characteristics of forgings is that they produce very, very strong metal uh, parts. Okay. As opposed to casting, right? Casting can create large parts, but they're typically not um, very uh, uh, strong in the sense that they're able to withstand impact and um, any kind of um, stress uh, like a forging can. Okay. Castings are strong, but they're also, uh, they also tend to be brittle. Um, just because of the microstructure of the, of the casting, uh, through the casting process. Forgings, on the other hand, as we'll show in some slides later on, produce very, very, very strong parts. So they're used where you need large parts that need to be structurally very, very strong. Um, and so we see that in the mining industry, uh, highway industry, oil and gas, shipbuilding, railroad, aerospace, you know, all, all these large industries, with the exception of medical. Uh, medical is, is not, is not a, um, a large, a, a producer of large machinery. All right. So there are three main elements of a forming process. Okay. Three main elements, three things that you need or that you need to, um, pay attention to, and that is the shaping device, how you're going to create the shape through the forming operation, the material temperature, whether it's going to be hot or cold, basically, because we can hot work metal or we can cold work metal. And each produces a different type of metal, a different type of part. Okay. And then finally, the third type or the third element of the forming process is how the force is being applied whether it's a press, a hammer, whether it's a rolling operation or whether it's a drawing operation, okay? So three elements that we need to focus on. What is the shaping device, okay? What is the material temperature and how is force being applied? Okay, so in the most basic type of um, forming or forging operation, we have what's called an open die forge or an open die process, okay? And this is where a metal block is manipulated between two dies, okay? And here we have the two dies. We have the upper die here and the lower die. Think of this, you know, if, if you've ever watched um, blacksmithing um, or even the TV show Forged in Fire, uh, you'll recognize this because this is basically what a blacksmith does. Okay, so the lower die would be replaced by an anvil and the upper die is going to be the hammer. Okay, so uh, so that's what an open die forges. Okay, so the upper die is going to move up and down with a fixed ry rhythm generating, generating a fixed force to basically compress this billet, this piece of metal. Typically, this billet is at an elevated temperature. Okay, so so it's very, very hot, um, and so it's more malleable. And the upper die is going to compress it down so that you basically flatten it out, okay? Uh, and that is open die forging, all right? It's also known as drop forging, upsetting, or smith forging. And there's your blacksmith smith forging. Um, mating dies are uh, one step remove from open dies, right? Remember with open dies, what's the shape of the die? Well, it's flat, right? The anvil and the hammer are basically flat. But when we go to mating dies, now we have a lower die that has some kind of contour cut into it and an upper die with a with another contour. It could be a, the same contour, it could be a different contour, whatever it is. But now when the force is applied, so that the upper die is going to smash down on the lower die. This billet of material inside is going to compress, smash in, and assume the shape of the die. Okay, so you can see here, and again, this, this, this billet of material in here is typically at a very elevated temperature, although for cold working it could be at a lower temperature, but nonetheless, um, it's, it's going to you know, it's going to smash down and it's going to make it ha take on this shape derived from the dies. Okay. Um, so uh, this is, this is also called uh, forging dies, right? Closed die drop forging or impression die forging. All right. This is also what we see when we do sheet metal stamping, 
uh, and we have drawing dies. All right, so it doesn't have to be, it could be thin sheets like this that are going to take the shape of the, of the dies. It doesn't have to be a thick billet like this. So for example, your car body panel, if you have uh, a metal car body panel, uh, not something like a, at a Saturn or, or some kind of composite frame, but a metal, di um, a, a metal body panel, it's going to, it's going to use a sheet metal stamping operation to basically stamp out the shape, um, of the body panel. All right, and that's using mating dies. We can also have one piece shape dies. Okay, so here we have a couple of different uh, options. We have an external die used for positive forming. And here we can see the external die. In this case, um, it looks, you know, think of this as um, an operation used to create maybe like a, uh, a plastic bowl, right? That you would eat or find, eat, in, uh, eat from or find in the kitchen, right? So here we have the negative shape of the bowl. And we're going to take um, a, a thin sheet of heated plastic. And um, it's heated sufficiently so it's in that plastic state. So it's able to be um, basically manipulated rather easily and we're going to take this and we're going to drape it down over that so we're going to lay it down over over that um, and we can even have a vacuum that helps to pull this down so you can see the vacuum is going to help pull the material down onto the surface and then when it cools um, it's going to assume that shape um, the the other type of one piece shape die is an internal die for negative uh, forming so um, same bowl, right? But let's, in, instead of having the negative of the bowl, that is to say the inside, we're going to have the outside of the bowl. Same idea. Again, we're going to have the heated plastic sheet, but this time we can blow air in here that's going to force it down onto the contour. We can then also have a vacuum that's going to help pull it down onto the shape. And then when it dries, we have that shape. Okay. This is used, for example, in thermoforming or metal spinning operations. <clears throat> we can also have the extrusion process. All right. Extrusions are used for making very long, continuous shapes. OK, um, so like a, a channel, right? An I-beam channel, a C-beam channel, things like that. Th those kind of long shapes. Um, we have a couple of uh, different options here. We have a direct extrusion and a direct extrusion on the left hand side. What you can see is here we have the hot billet of material and you're going to hear that term over and over again. A billet basically is like a metal blank, right? So uh, you have a hot billet of material that's, that's um, placed into the chamber, right? It's, it's at a very elevated temperature, very, very hot. And then we're going to have this ram that is going to come and just press very, very hard, very, very high level of force. It's going to smash the heated billet through this extrusion die, right? And this extrusion die right here is going to force it out into the shape, uh, into the desired shape. Okay. And so that's called direct extrusion where the basically here, the ram is going to operate against the, um, uh, the, the billet and, and the, the, uh, die is on the opposite side. Okay. So it goes ram, billet, uh, die. All right. On an indirect extrusion, all right, it's going to work a little bit differently. So we still, we, we heat the billet up and we place it in a chamber, right? So the billet is, a, again, at a very elevated temperature, very, very, very hot. Uh, it's into that temperature where it's going to have plastic deformation. But this time, the die and the uh, ram are kind of built together. So the die is going to be part of the ram. And here the ram is just going to slam into the billet. And it's going to squeeze out the uh, the extrusion going back against the direction of flow of the ram. Okay, so one way to think about this is the direction of flow, right? If the force is being applied in the same direction as the flow, then that's direct extrusion. If the force is being applied in the opposite direction of the flow, then that's indirect extrusion. 
Here's some uh, examples of the shape dies that are used to create extrusions. All right, they're they're very complex. Right, we're not going to get into uh, the the design of these. This is you know that that is a whole science unto itself. But I think it's just instructive to kind of look at how they um, uh, see what they look like. So here we have solid profile dies, and you can see the shape that they're going to extrude. Right, it's kind of interesting. We've probably seen some of these shapes around, you know, in a Home Depot or somewhere. And here's a hollow profile die. These are used to create hollow shapes, right? These are open shapes, right? Uh, these are creating hollow shapes, like a tube, all right? Um, rolling, all right? The rolling operation is kind of similar to the extrusion operation, except uh, we're not going to force it through um, a, a single die. We're going to basically form it through a series of progressive dies, okay? So here we have a, uh, a piece of stock, right? And it's starting, it starts on the right-hand side as a sheet of flat stock. Um, and it may or may not be elevated in temperature, okay? It, it may or may not be. Um, typically, this is going to be a, a more, uh, a softer metal, maybe an aluminum, maybe something you know, uh, that, that is going to be able to shape without a whole lot of force or high temperatures. All right. And then it's going to go through a series of progressive dies. So you can see the first die is just going to flatten it out. Then the second die, as it goes through that, it's going to introduce this little, um, this little buckle in the middle of it. And then it's going to deepen that buckle in the next die. So that, that little, uh, groove now is deeper and, and it's bringing it in so it's folding up the edges on the side. And then um, we have uh, deeper still with the edges. Now we have another die on the bottom that's gonna help really turn those outside edges up. And then finally, we have the final shape where we have that little uh, channel. We have the squared sides, okay? Um, and you can see how each one of the dies works, or pair of dies, I should say, to create the intended shape. All right. Um, these are similar to uh, the extrusion process. All right. All right. So one of the things that we're going to talk about in this uh, in this series of chapters in, in section three is uh, hot working metals and cold working metals. OK, both of these are going to be in the forming process. All right. But hot working metals basically means that we're going to work the metal. We're, we're going to the manufacturing process. The forming process is going to be performed at a temperature above the recrystallization temperature of the metal. All right. So you can see right here. Here's the recrystallization temperature, you know, that is kind of visualized right here. Anything above this temperature, when the metal or plastic is above this temperature, then it's considered hot working. All right. And we can hot work plastics, metals, and ceramics. The cold working process is done at any temperature below recrystallization. Now that doesn't mean that it's going to be room temperature. Oftentimes the cold working process is done at a very hot temperature, right? The recrystallization temperature can be upwards of five, six, seven hundred degrees. So anything below the recrystallization temperature would be considered cold working. Cold working processes can be done with metals and they can be done with ceramics. You cannot cold work with plastics though. Okay. So one of the, uh, well, not one of the, uh, a main difference with between hot working and cold working and really the point of using one versus the other is how the process manipulates and controls grain size and grain growth. Okay. So with a hot working process, right, you're going to so you can see here is the here is the piece of metal at an elevated temperature and it's being fed through these two just flat cylindrical dies as it's going through here the dies are turning right the dies are turning and feeding this through think of this like a pasta maker right so the dies are turning forcing this through the the uh grains are going to be squeezed out so that they become longer right I think that makes sense. You know, when you're forcing it through these two turning dies here, they're going to be squeezed out nice and long, 
But because they're at an elevated temperature, as they cool, they're going to shrink back again. All right. So notice the re after recrystallization, which basically means after it cools sufficiently, we have smaller grains. All right. So we have what's called a loss of strength, right? Longer grains equals stronger metal. Smaller grains is a, uh, I don't want to say a weaker metal, but a not a metal that's not as strong. Okay. Now with a cold working operation, notice that the metal is going through, but it's not at an elevated temperature. So we're still going to be elongating these dot, these grains as they go through the rollers, as they're being worked, they're still going to be elongated, but now they have no process to uh, recrystallize and become smaller again, right? Because the recrystallization um, occurs with the temperature change from hot to cold, and that's what fosters the recrystallization. Here, there's no temperature change, right? There's so so the grains never recrystallize into smaller grains. So typically, a cold work metal is going to be much stronger, harder. It's going to be more brittle, but it's also going to be much stronger. Okay. Um, and, you know, using the analogy again of the paperclip, um, when you, if you take your paperclip, right, that you, you know, unfolded, you know, however, however much, and so you have, you can grab both ends of it. If you wiggle it back and forth, bending it back and forth, back and forth, right, maybe do it 10 or 15 times, and then feel the, um, the, the, the point of the, um, uh, of the paper quote where it was being bent, you'll feel that it's hot, all right? That's because the temperature in that metal is is rising because of your working. Your what you're doing right there was cold working, cold working your paper clip, right? You were bending it back and forth, you were working it, um, and uh, but it wasn't an elevated temperature. The temperature did rise because you were working it. Um, and that's one of the byproducts of the cold working process is the temperature does rise as you go through here, right? But certainly not to the level that we're talking about with hot working. All right. So um, just to zero in on uh, some of the advantages and disadvantages of each one of these for hot working temperature is above recrystallization temperature. Um, recrystallization occurs without deformation. All right. That is recrystallization of the grains occurs without the, when, when it's just cooling off. Strain hardening is avoided, right? Strain hardening is, is a phenomenon in metal that basically means um, the material gets, gets uh, harder, gets stronger, right? Recrystallization depends on temperature, right? How high uh, the temperature was to start with, um, the time in, that you're giving it to recrystallize, and the amount of deformation that it underwent. Plastics and ceramics are always hot worked, right? So the advantages, hardness and ductility are unchanged, right, in the metal. So when you start with a hardness and a, and a ductile metal, um, hot working is not going to change that. Um, you eliminate porosities. Think about it. When you smash things together under those rollers, you're going to squeeze out all the little air pockets that we call porosities. Your metal structure, your material structure is improved because you're basically squeezing the shape down into these elongated crystals and then you're allowing them to recrystallize. So you're actually going to improve that material structure. Large shape changes are possible because um, the elevated temperature uh, allows a, a, a better, uh, uh, more detailed forming process and impurities are broken up and redistributed. The disadvantages, it has low to medium accuracy, right? Um, there is shrinking uh, involved in hot working, shrinking and expansion, right? Metals shrink and expand as they heat and cool and cool down. So anytime you have that, uh, you know, that shrinking and expanding, that just turns into uh, accuracy loss, right? Parts can warp, warp during cooling. Oxidation can be severe. That means rust. Rust on the surface can be very severe. You have no increase in strength. Right. So even though hardness and ductility are left alone, unchanged with the original metal, you don't make it any stronger. You actually get lower strength on the outer layers. 
Um, with extreme hot working and, and, you know, forming, you can actually get fatigue cracks appearing because you're just working it too hard and it costs more, right? Because we're raising the temperature and we need special dyes and stuff, special processes. So, uh, it's more costly. Now con contrast that with cold working. Cold working, the temperature is below the recrystallization temperature. Okay. Um, cold working. Uh, is preferred for soft metals, aluminum, standard steels, carbon alloy steels. The advantages are no heating is required, right? So, hey, we save, we save cost and time that way. Um, close dimensional tolerances, because now we don't have that corresponding uh, expansion and shrinkage that we get with raising or um, uh, higher temperatures. Better surface finish. And strength, hardness, and directional properties are improved. Directional properties mean strength, strength in a certain, in the direction that the material is being squeezed. Disadvantages are we get residual stresses. There is much higher forces required. When you're not heating up the metal to cold work it, uh, it takes some really high forces. You need very strong tooling and the metal must be clean and scale free. So you can't have any kind of, you know, messed up surface on the metal. All right. So um, talking a little bit about the stress drain curve, right? We already introduced this uh, early on in chapter three, but it bears repeating. And um, so I've so I put one on here that has some different areas. Um, so first, some definitions. Stress here is force divided by area. All right. What we might call pressure. Right. Pressure PSI pounds per square inch. Pounds is force per square inch is area. So stress, think of pounds per square inch or PSI. OK. As we raise the stress, right, from that is we apply pressure, right, um, from the origin to point A, it deforms elastically, all right? So again, imagine your paper clip. If we apply a pressure to it, but the pressure is just to this level, when we bend it, bending is applying a pressure, when we bend it and release it, it's going to go, it's gonna go up here and then it's gonna come right back down, right? So it's gonna operate right on this line right here. As we apply a stress, it goes up here, it's going to, stretch a little bit, but then as we remove that stress, it's going to go right back down to this, okay? Now, as we apply a little bit more stress, as we go from this amount of stress to a higher level of stress, now we're going above this point, the proportional limit, and we're moving on to point B called the yield point or elastic limit. And basically, now we're getting some plastic deformation, okay? So if we're taking our paper clip and we bend it a little bit with a little bit more pressure, a little bit further up to this point right here, and we release it, what happens is we're going to get a, um, the, the um, paper clip is going to go back a little bit almost to its original shape. Okay, almost to its original shape. That that point where it goes back a little bit is called the recovery. All right, that's called the recovery. So we have plastic deformation. That is, it stays a little bit bent, but there's a little bit of recovery. So it springs back a little bit. Now, if we um, go a little bit further, now we're talking about uh it deforming anything past point B, it's deforming plastically. That is to say it's bending, all right? And when we go to E, E, it can't go any further. E is what's called the fracture point. That's where you bend the paper clip and it just snaps, okay? Um, so from B to E is our plastic region. And E is fracture. All right, so let's... Uh, look at some forming machinery here real quickly. Uh, this is just a few uh, pictures 
Um, there would be a, a few videos here, but remember I've moved those videos off into the module on a separate page. So please, 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 you got to go watch these videos. These videos for forming processes are way cool. Um, I mean, we're talking some serious machinery, um, some serious force. Uh, you know, it, there's a lot going on. So these are really cool videos to watch. I picked them out. Um, you know, went through a lot of hours to try to find some really good explanatory videos to really help drive the picture home of what a forging forming process looks like and all its uh, variations and, uh, and, and different appearances. OK, so here we can see uh, this is a press, right? You can see that. Look at that big hydraulic ram right there. That is huge. That that is a person right there. Right. So that's pretty big. Here we have a, a roll forming operation or a, um, you know, we're, we're taking a sheet right here and we're going through a series of progressive dies. Uh, it looks like it's going from near to far, right? So it's starting out here. I think that's what it is because the dies get progressively more um, bendy. Um, here is a, uh, this looks like a hammer forge, right? Um, a press. Uh, and you'll see this in the video, a press is going to press down slowly, but, you know, with a, with a lot of force. It's just going to press down. A hammer is going to be something that impacts it with a very high force, but very short duration, like a hammer. Boom, boom, boom. So, and this person, uh, this operator right here, it looks like he's spraying. What they do is they spray a... Um, a, a release agent because they, you don't want the metal, this hot metal right here, you don't want the hot metal to stick to the dye. That would be very bad. So they spray this release agent on there. And it basically, it's like an oil, you know, uh, something that's not going to catch on fire, but it's an oil to help the hot metal release from the dye so you don't have a, a, a problem with that. And this is a wire forming operation. Okay. All right, so that takes us through um, chapter nine here. Uh, in the next video, we will look at chapter 10 and get into, I think chapter 10 is uh, hot working. All right, so I'll see you in the next video.